Please remember the views and opinions expressed by this show or any other show on DV Radio and its guests are strictly those of said individuals and do not reflect those of the DV Radio staff nor the staff of dysfunctional veterans. From issues plaguing the veteran community, this is where we discuss topics such as the VA, social stigmas, issues from our veteran community around the world and here at home. Join the hosts from DV Radio Shows, outside guests, and much more. Ask your questions during the show and we'll answer them. This is Round Table Discussion. What is up, everybody? This is Roundtable Discussions here on DVRadio.net, WDVR. I'm Bo from Barracks Talk and a lot of other places here on DV Radio. Uh, tonight, just so everyone is reminded about Roundtable Discussions before we go into tonight's topic, Roundtable Discussions is a video and audio show. However, only the video is only the live audio feed is being streamed tonight. The video portion will be available in a few weeks after the holidays via DV Radio's YouTube. Uh, we will introduce everyone and uh, the way this show will work, I am the moderator, which means I will be the one to direct the questions. And if we must, I will stop people short so we can move on to get in as much as possible tonight. If we're unable to finish uh, these questions and discussions, we will have either an afterthoughts roundtable discussions or this will continue next week or within our guest schedules. But uh, without further ado, we're going to go on to tonight's topic. Uh, we do have PTS dog Joaquin Watai. Nia from Psychiatric Service Dog 411, Brad and Dr. Veronica Morris from Psychiatric Service Dog Partners, and SCAV of the SCAV and Scout Chronicles. Um, tonight's roundtable discussions is about the Amer American Kennel Club that sent out an email uh, to AKC certified evaluators announcing its partnership with the American Service Dog Access Coalition. Uh, the uh, uh, blah, blah. The Association of Service Dog Providers for Military Veterans to create a service dog reg registry called the Service Dog Pass. This announcement met with consternation from me and the service dog handling community in cooperation with the service dog show. We here at DV Radio wanted to bring together several people, i.e. the people I just introduced to you, uh, versed in accessibility issues for service dog handlers to discuss the service dog pass and why it is not uh, only a poorly thought out idea, but could ultimately be detrimental to disabled people as a whole. Uh, again, we've got Joaquin Watai, Nia, uh, Scav, and Brad, and Dr. Veronica Morris. How's everyone doing this evening? Doing very doing well. Great. Thank you. Good, good. Now, it's going to look weird for the ones that are, are looking at their, at their Zoom right now, but the way it is for me, top left is Joaquin Watai. Then to the right is Veronica Morris and Brad, and bottom left is Scav, and to his right is Nia. So that's how I'm going to be doing this order tonight. So please don't get, uh, you know, brain farted during that moment. Um, so if you won't, we'll go ahead and jump right into this. And uh, JJ, I'll start with you. Like I said, has the American Kennel Club, or as we'll uh, refer to them as the AKC, ever done anything like this before where they claim to have some insight into the service dog world? And with that, in your opinion, what is really driving this push for a service dog registry? So to my knowledge, although there are many AKC trainers who also uh, do, and, and what I mean by an AKC trainer, there are many trainers who uh, train to the standards of the AKC's um, canine good citizenship, advanced good citizenship, uh, urban citizenship tests. Um, and uh, there, there are many people involved with dog training organizations who use those behavioral tests as benchmarks for the uh, training levels of the dogs. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. It's great that they have some behavioral standards that they expect. Um, the, the problem is that the AKC has never quote unquote certified a service dog. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One of which is, although you can train standard, uh, just general obedience behaviors, how to behave out in public, Task-wise, there, there's it's almost impossible to make a standard because each dog needs to be individually trained for each individual with a disability. 
You match one dog to one person and that dog's tasking is specific to that person. So how do you get a standard there? How does a standard come about when no two disabled individuals are the same? So the tasks that a dog is going to perform to assist a disabled handler is not the same. Um, that being said, uh, there, there, there are some fairly obvious to me motives behind this. The primary one being uh, monetization of disability, quite frankly. It is, a, it is a very calculated business move to make money off of disabled people. The problem is most disabled people live on a fixed income because they are disabled. So where's all this money going to come from for, for disabled people to be able to participate in this program? Because somebody's going to have to pay the evaluators. Um, I see this as a very uh, um, mercenary move on, on the part of the AKC. I get that 100%. Veronica, Brad, do you want to uh, give your opinion and uh, about uh, what's really driving this push for a, a service dog registry? Sure. Well, I, I'd like to answer your uh, question about has the AKC done this before? And the answer is yes, actually. Last year in 2018, um, AKC renamed their urban, their canine good citizen urban test, a public access test. Um, and we mounted a, uh, a signature campaign and got over 2,000 signatures for people who did not want AKC to rebrand their test to public access test. For those who don't know, a public access test is a term of art in the service dog community. It's a test that demonstrates a level of behavior um, that a, a fully trained service dog might be able to, uh, to meet. Um, and so, but AKC is offering this canine good citizen U, U, uh, urban or now public access test to um, all types of pet dogs. Um, and so the, the service dog community was very against this, but, um, and our organization specifically exchanged several emails with AKC about it. Um, and they did not seem interested in learning about disability rights or uh, service dog culture or anything like that. Um, do you want to some, add something to that, Brad? Right, well, last month, for instance, we, we were in DC, we had a, a meeting with um, the US Department of Transportation. And when we got there after a full day, day's train ride, we got to the hotel and we had a very serious access challenge because this was a pet friendly hotel and they didn't really understand how they were supposed to treat the service dog users. And it, it took a long time and we have, we now have to file a complaint with the Department of Justice because of that confusion. The reason I'm bringing this up is because AKC's intention in changing their name with the AKCU to, to add public access test to it is they wanted to make it easier for people with pets to be able to signal to hotels and other businesses that that might be pet friendly that their pet was okay because they had passed an akc test saying that that dog had manners so from my perspective that just adds a whole new layer of confusion to things and when we tried to tell akc look we've got thousands of service dog users who are saying just use another term do your test but use another term they said oh no we're working with other service dog users and by that, they meant a few select people with a certain perspective disregarding disability rights. And, and they basically said, screw you, we're gonna do what we wanna do. And we know we are not the only user group that wrote into them because we have a coalition of user groups and we saw the other letters that were going in. So it seems like I'm not, I don't have in my mind that we are going to uh, change what, what AKC is going to do because they seem determined to do whatever is going to be in their, I'll say financial interest, but whatever it is, the only thing that I, I'm looking for us to do now is to put pressure on them if they're going to do the wrong thing and make it uncomfortable if they're going to continue to choose to participate in this pattern of disrupting the lives of people with disabilities without regard for what we have to say about how it affects us. Right. Scav, your uh, thoughts and opinions? 
Well, <clears throat> when uh, it's been four four years ago, somewhere around there, um, the obedience courses uh, over in Ohio, the one kennel club offers, they do uh, pretty much for the dog and pony shows. But you're forced to go through the the AKC CGC test before they, they even let you graduate. So, um, and it's for all dogs. So they had no idea back then what a service dog was. So it, it's just one of those, they, they were in it for the money for obedience. They're in it for the money for pets. And now they found another, uh, a money train. Um, and, and like Joaquin said, you know, this is, they, they don't know what my tasks or requirements are. They don't know what his task requirements are. So this is good. This is going to be interesting. I got you 100%. Nia, your thoughts and opinions. Oh gosh, where do I even start? Um, <laughs> so uh, what I do, I, I kind of want to piggyback on a little bit of what Brad was saying um, to add to his commentary. Um, we all know that HUD, uh, just kicked the registry question over to the FTC, who's investigating the uh, misleading consumers' practices of those registries. And what AKC to me is, that's the mother of all of them. The name recognition, the trust that people have in that organization um, creates a sense of trust and comfort, and they're taking advantage of that, and they're misleading consumers. And not, not only are they doing that, but they're wrapping up something that's actually encouraging fraud <laughs> um, by pet owners to have public access certified dogs uh, by an organization that has worldwide name recognition and lobbying power. To me, that's like the height of misleading a, con a consumer while actually exacerbating a very real problem that the disabled handler community has. And so that's my bone to pick with AKC is it's it's very irresponsible and the, and they don't care. And I think our community needs to um, be aware of how that works and how it affects them right down to their day to day. Because, you know, my my neighbor can go take her dog and get the certification and now she has a public act. I mean, it's just it muddle it muddies the waters even more. So, and registries don't solve the problem. So if you're going to put your weight behind something, um, solve a problem with it instead of actually making it worse and becoming, you know, the steroid version of it, of the problem. Right. So those are my thoughts on that. If, if, if I could add, um, Nia made an important point that, that the AKC throwing their name power in muddies mm -hmm. the waters. The law does not require, nor does the law recognize registrations or certifications. There's a reason for that. Um, and and uh, by kind of throwing their hat in the ring with their lobbying power behind it, um, what the, the push seems to be uh, is to remove the rights from disabled handlers. Um, because right now, as the law stands, the ADA is not a law about service dogs. Service dogs are included in the law. The ADA mm -hmm. is, a, is a law guaranteeing the right of equal access for all disabled people, regardless of what kind of equipment they use to assist them with their disability. I'm not saying a service dog is equipment. I'm saying it is legally considered as durable medical equipment under the ADA for the purposes of equality of access. Now we're throwing in confusion and muddying the waters um, and introducing barriers, especially when people say, say, for, for example, checking into a hotel. And I've had this happen on multiple occasions. Well, the last service dog handler that came in had a registration card. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. Well, the last service dog that came in, and I just look at the person that's challenging me and say, that probably wasn't a service dog because the law does not require or recognize these, these registries. But now you put the AKC's name behind it. That has 
legal lobbying power. There's money involved, a lot of money. And wow. this could lead to the stripping of rights for disabled people simply because, quite frankly, we don't have enough money to fight it. You're, you're exactly the, right. I, I, I just want to say you're exactly right, JJ. Uh, you and Nia did bring up the ADA. ADA is Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm disabled. I have a power chair and a wheelchair. So what they're basically saying is if you've got a wheelchair, power chair, cane, wheelchair, uh, uh, walker or anything like that, you need to register it. No, I'm not because you're telling me that I can't go into a public place without having a license for my wheelchair. That's absolutely retarded. Uh, I don't hey, care I what anybody I says. Drive. Right. <laughs> um, it's it's about as ridiculous as uh, I think uh, earlier this year they passed a, a law in, in some uh, counties and states where you've got to have a license to ride a bicycle. If that's not the most idiotic thing I've ever heard, I don't know what is. Uh, but uh, if you don't mind, we'll go on to uh, this next uh, this next thing. We'll start with Veronica and Brad this time. Are there any unintended consequences of service dog ID programs, and I've got uh, a, a lead on with that. Uh, how do you think people who support these ideas imagine the whole system will work? Well, that's good. It's, it's probably good to start with that, how people probably imagine this will work, because for me, it's, people often come up with this thinking that it's, it's some kind of panacea, that it will solve all the problems. Because what they see is, okay, problem. There's fraud, and they often don't see that, they're, that there's ignorance. And so they think, okay, well, how do we solve fraud? Well, we make sure that everyone has the, the right certification because that solves all the problems. And in our heads, that sounds really good. It's just like a license. You know, you just do registration. Everything's good to go, and it works perfectly. So they think that on the one hand, Everyone who has a service dog and you know a disability along with that will be able to get certified, no problem, and they'll show their ID everywhere they go and everything will be fine and no one will be bothered by that. No one will ever lose their ID and everything will be great. And on the other hand, everyone who doesn't have a disability and a service dog will not be able to get this thing and it won't be falsifiable. And all of the store employees will be perfectly educated on this, even though they haven't been educated on the existing laws. Now, that presupposes a heck of a lot that we find doesn't actually happen in practice. So when we're talking about the ADA, um, like Joaquin was saying, it, it's this access law. Its point is not to punish people with disabilities and make things hard for them. Its point is to grant access to people with disabilities. So that is always priority one. When you're looking at some kind of program to attack fraudsters or eliminate some kind of prob uh, problem or perceived problem, you need to never forget priority one. And what we're doing with some of these programs is we're giving up disability access to go after fraud and ignorance uh, because you, you often have to make this choice so the choice in my head is you can prioritize civil rights and a love of people with disabilities, if you will, or you can decide that your hate of wrongdoers and the ignorant should drive how we shape our society. So I think that a big part of the problem is that the people who are having this very normal reaction, that, exactly, that's their reaction, <laughs> is they see a problem they, they hate the evildoers because it must be black or white, good or evil. And so they come up with this, this solution that has no background in disability rights. And it sounds good because they're just not aware. And I'm trying to be charitable because I've had a lot of good friends that I've been able to educate about this who they just weren't aware of the problems that come along with this. And some other people have mentioned these problems and if anyone else, I would like to say one of the problems. I'm, I'll leave all. I'll leave other problems for everyone else. But I'm going to give a personal example. Um, when you have, a, when you're able to flash some sort of ID or certification or something like that, businesses think that they have to allow you. They cease looking at the behavior of the dog. 
So I used to live in California and California has a very stupid thing called the service dog ID tag that varies from county to county and it's just, it's a horrible system. But the point is that some counties give out a tag that the dog can wear that says it's a service dog. So I was in a store with my first service dog, Sabrina, and there was another dog in the store um, and it was barking at other patrons in the store. And when it saw my service dog, Sabrina, it tried to attack her. Luckily it was on leash. Not all these dogs that I have encounters with are on leash, but this one was on leash. So since the dog was barking at everyone and trying to attack my service dog, I told the manager of the store, look, you know, the ADA says that you can ask these questions of the handler. And then even if the handler answers these questions appropriately, if the dog is attacking people, disruptive, destructive, stuff like that, you can legally kick them out. So the manager said, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. By the way, before I had went to the manager, the, the owner of this dog admitted to me that she was not disabled in any way. So the manager went over and talked to the person. She admitted to the manager she was not disabled in any way. Her dog was barking at and trying to go after the manager. But she showed the manager her ID tag from the state of California saying that her dog was a service dog. So the manager came back over to me and said, there's nothing I can do. The dog has an ID tag from the state saying it's a service dog. And I said, but she doesn't have a disability. He said, I know, she told me that. He said, but the dog attacked my service dog and is barking at all the other people in the store. And he said, yeah, but she has the ID tag. So, you know, I have to allow her. And he wouldn't kick her out. And that's just one of the problems that, that these types of IDs or registries or certifications that people show in order to gain access cause that the, the businesses suddenly think it's a free pass for bad behavior and they don't think they can do anything to take advantage of the business's right to, and the public's right of safety to have a misbehaving dog removed. You're exactly right. Before I go to SCAB, we live in a world and society where someone can put on a suit, tie, and get out a microphone and camera, whether they're in press or not, and you will talk to them. I don't care who you are. You're going to talk to them. You're going to trust them because they're that imagery of, okay, this is someone I can trust. Same thing with these registrations, in my personal opinion. Um, Scav, again, I'm going to reiterate what this uh, question is. Are there any unintended consequences of service dog ID programs? And along with that, how do you think people who support these ideas imagine the whole system will work? Oh, yeah. Um, we we run into it daily. Um, you can just do a Google search and hell, even on Facebook, you can see all the, uh, the, the fake registries that are out there. Um, they, they want you to get online and pay $79 and they'll send you, you know, your, your free card and your, your free pretty much Mickey mouse club pass and kit. Right. Um, and you can take fluffy or, or whoever out to wherever, um, and just like these guys have already told you, it's, it's an issue. You know, I've been to the stores where, um, little dogs are being carried. Sometimes it's legit, you know, sometimes that dog's a, a diabetic service dog or whatnot. And the people actually know what they're doing. Other times they're riding around in shopping carts or, you know, they're pissing all over the aisles. Right. It, the biggest fear we have is our dogs getting attacked and if you know they take scout out or they take skeeter out because you know they got uh, the the fake registry or they're certified at a hotel or a grocery store or whatnot and the managers you know they see these cards and it it's it's comes down to education well really quick scav you and i were talking with oink in uh chat on dvradio.net forward slash chat talking about okay. the canine good citizenship test uh that was sold in quotations uh to you guys what is that and how would this registry pertain to something like that uh, the canine good uh the cgc um yeah the akc owns that pretty much and 
you have to pass it at, uh, at the end of an obedience training. If you go out to your obedience, uh, like your puppy kindergartens and all that other stuff. Um, and you get a letter saying that you passed it from, you get your certificates and you could turn it into your homeowner's insurance is how they sold it to us. You take this test, uh, turn it in your homeowner's insurance and they'll lower your homeowner's insurance by a certain percent. And now, just to proves, clarify for everybody what this is, it's something that basically says your dog, which is an animal, no matter if it's domesticated or not, an animal will not attack someone else. Is that what this correct. is basically for? Okay. Yeah, it, it's proving to everybody, you know, the in your homeowner's insurance that your dog's not going to attack because it's passed this test and it's now a good dog. So when somebody comes knocking on your door, this dog's not going to attack you is how they sold it to me and everybody else in this class. But, you know, when if you come knock on my door right now, every one of these dogs is going to just go nuts. None of them are going to attack you, but they're just going to go completely ape shit. Right. But I, I don't know. They, they tell you what you want to hear. It's a good sales pitch. Um, and that's what I'm afraid with this with this, uh, you know, them backing these registries is they're going to give us a good sales <clears throat> pitch and it's going to be just like this canine good citizenship test. Anybody's going to be able to do it. Right. Uh, Nia, same question for you. Are there any unintended consequences of the service ID programs? And how do you think people who support these ideas imagine the whole system will work? Um, the uh, the registries uh, and the people who believe in them are doing what I call whacking at leaves problem solving. So when you have a problem or we get cancer, we go to the source of that pro that cancer and we cut it out or we nuke it or we chemo it, right? Mm -hmm. um, we don't we don't just take the tumor that's growing in one area. We're going to go and get it all out. So registries whack at leaves. Um, SCAV is uh, what he just explained is one of those unintended consequences of a registry. Um, and and by, by misleading people into thinking that because you, a, an animal passed um, a certain uh, skill set at a particular moment, giving the false impression to people that that will protect them and mean something. It, it increases the probability that that dog will not be a problem, but it's never a guarantee. And people get those false sense of securities from them. Um, the other thing too is uh, how people imagine this will work is that they're going to, get these certifications and that everything's going to be okay and the problems are going to be solved or diminished. Right. Um, the thing is, is even the people selling these registries and these certificates are not doing the one thing that guarantees that people will uh, perform better or be more responsible or aware of what's going on. And that is real accurate education. Okay. The reason people don't know what's going on and organizations get behind this type of stuff is because they don't have a good understanding about what our problems are as disabled handlers. The cost of this and the standards of this service dog pass, and I just from what I've studied from it, the law says a, a task trained animal. It does not say a, a, a task team, uh, the dog must know three, three tasks, right? So that's one way it's adding burdens. Now, if I just needed one task, and I know many handlers that literally have one real task that they need, but now I got to train it two more because I want, because of this pass. Okay. The cost, right? Limited income. So it's not solving problems, actually creating more. And it's not going to diminish really the frequency of problems. Because what Veronica said, if people have a sense, sense, a false sense that these IDs make these people impervious or, or um, absol absolves them of having to follow certain rules, they're allowed to continue to misbehave. So that pass does not guarantee good behavior. All that pass does is give people false sense of 
security for a problem that they're actually making worse. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that I, I feel about that. Brad? That I feel. Yeah, there's something I'd like to add if I can about my experience um, with stories I've heard from others and my own personal experience with the execution of these kinds of programs, the AKC programs. So the overarching theme of why people with disability rights backgrounds get angry at this kind of thing is we're talking about the the validation from a third party an outside person of you and your ability to gain public access just like anyone without a disability has and when whenever you subject people with disabilities to these kinds of tests that aren't available to everyone and aren't aren't worked out well with their practical execution then what you're doing is you're setting up significant barriers uh, to their access. So on, on one side of things, you've got uh, the stigma, especially when it comes to mental illness, you've got a lot of stigma out there. Um, and when it comes to disability in general, you've got stigma and misunderstanding about how things are supposed to work. So we're asking people who may have varying degrees of education about that and varying stereotypes and prejudice to evaluate people. And for instance, um, I've heard of, of service dog programs that will take someone, an outsider, through a training process to certify them. Um, but then if their dog can't, uh, say, pick up some keys because its mouth is oddly shaped, and that person has zero need for that dog to be able to pick up keys, they won't pass that person's evaluation because that is not in line with their program. So there are some odd ideas about there that are exclusionary for some people with disabilities, in addition yep. to the prejudice. Um, but on the other hand, I've been involved in some tests that were overly inclusive. So because I use a power wheelchair, the people at our local dog training club love to use me in tests because, oh, well, if the dog can be around a guy who used to have a big beard and you know, wears a hat and is in a power wheelchair, then we know that the dog is going to be safe and it's going to pass this test. Well, I've been in tests where the dog could not be around me without growling. And I thought for sure, hey, usually they pass, you know, just about everyone, but I thought for sure this one time, clearly you don't want to pass this dog at being safe in public. But guess what? They pass the dog anyway. So you're relying on evaluators that some of whom are willing to pass everyone, some of whom are willing to have overly high standards. And these are evaluators that are going to be far away from people in, in rural locations. And th yep. this is going to cost money, people to, to uh, cost people money to travel to, to pay for the tests. So the practical execution, all the, the devil is definitely in the details. Um, if you can't see it in the foreground for disability rights, then you can definitely see it when you start to think about the details. Yes. Yeah. It, before I go to this next one, it seems to me like this whole. I what's that? Question. Yeah. I, was I, I, <laughs> I know. I know. I know. But what I was going to say is what I think bothers me most about this whole ID registry thing is it seems like it's coming from people who sit behind a desk all day or in a, a nice cozy office and have no clue, A, what disabilities uh, any of us have, and B, how a service dog actually works. They're just going by what they have perceived in their mind, what they've seen on television, movies, stuff like that. I might be wrong. I don't see me being wrong because I've seen all this BS for the last few years, but it's, it's my opinion. Uh, JJ, the same questions to you. Yeah, so here's the problem. The, the focus of this whole push for registries um, comes very specifically from the Association of Service Dog Providers for Military Veterans and the Service Dog Access Coalition. Um, these people are pushing this and they have, they have a very specific intention in mind. And that is to get a law passed called the Pause Act that requires the VA to pay for 400 service dogs over a period of five years at a price tag of $10 million. And all those dogs are coming from 
uh, members of the Association of Service Dog Providers for Military Veterans. So bottom line, like I said before, is that the, the main focus behind this is money. It's monetizing disability. And uh, one of the, the tenets of the uh, PAWS Act is that there has to be a national standard. And I'm, I'm doing air quotes for those listening. There has to be a national standard of training. Um, here's, here's the problem, and everybody's touched on this. Depending on what your disability is, depends on what your dog's trained to do to assist with your disability. And no two of us look the same. Although we may have very similar tasks, our symptomology is all unique. Our, what we train our dog to do is unique to our symptomology, our personal symptomology. And the law actually says that a service dog is a dog that is trained, individually trained to perform work or tasks for its disabled handler. One dog, one handler, specific tasking to that handler. The dog is not cookie cutter trained. There's not a list of acceptable tasks and that's all that is acceptable because what works for me may not work for Veronica, may not work for Scav, may not work for Nia. Perfect example, Scav's dog Scout is trained in hearing alert. Although I do have hearing problems, that are deemed acceptable by the Department of Veterans Affairs. I don't have hearing loss near to the degree that SCAV does. I don't need Skeeter to alert me when I don't hear something because I can hear it. So Scout's dog is trained in completely different tasks than I am. And if there's some artificially imposed standard from an organization that all these dogs have to be trained to, then it's no longer individual. And, and again, as Brad said, all of a sudden, we're not worrying about disability and disabled people's needs or our rights. We're worried about looking good and making money while we do it. And that's really what's, what's behind this. But even more so, what's dr driving, I think, kind of the hysterical response is that everybody is focused on the wrong thing. Everybody is looking at the flashy news stories about the uh, you know, quote unquote, service dog that bit a stewardess on an airplane. And, and you know, the, the quote unquote service dog that attacked yada, 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 and, and fake service dog, fake service dog, fake service dog. Everybody's focused on what sells stories. You know what? If it bleeds, it leads. And nobody's remembering that the ADA is not a law about dogs. The ADA includes the use of service dogs for disabled people in order to gain equal access. And everybody is focused on what's flashy and sells headlines, and nobody's focused on the actual need of the actual disabled people who use service dogs and are not who are causing trouble. But who's going to end up paying? Because the ultimate goal of this, there's one direction this is going. People are pushing to have to require, to change the ADA and require registration for service dogs. People want to take away our rights, okay? And I use this parallel a lot. Look at how that's worked with the Second Amendment. An amendment to the Constitution states that the right to keep and bear arms is shall not be infringed upon. And yet you have places in this country <clears throat> where now, the neighbor can call and say they're worried about you and they think you have guns and the police can come kick in your door and, and, and infringe upon your rights. And this all came about over a period of time, over, over a little more than 100 years of compromises and reasonable, you know, reasonable uh, uh, changes in compromises. And it took slowly eroded the right of the American citizen to keep and bear arms as it was written in the constitution. Well, we're, we're looking at an exact parallel with service dogs. Once we start taking away the right, because we have to compromise because this fake service dog problem, right? Then all of a sudden the people who actually need service dogs, who use them and who rely on them for their lives, such as those of us on this panel today, we're the ones who, who suffer the consequences, but we're not the people who are causing the problems. It's people who are either poorly educated or uneducated, 
or know just enough to know that they can bully their way through by screaming discrimination and, and, and threatening to sue. And it's gotten to the point where businesses, um, corporations have, have instated policies that essentially tie their own hands because they're because it's less expensive for them to allow people to misrepresent their dogs as service dogs than it is to be responsible, ask the people with dogs that are obviously not well-trained to remove their animals. And then if those people actually sue, deal with those consequences. It's cheaper to endanger disabled people than to uphold their own rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the ADA gives businesses the right to ask that misbehaved dogs be removed. One thing I'd like to add um, that is, is another uh, misconception is, you know, a public access test that this is all centers around, you take your dog and you get it tested, is only good for the day that the dog passed the test because they are living beings. And the, you, no matter how well, I mean, Skeeter's incredibly well-trained. I trust him with my life, literally. But I also know that if somebody kicks him, he's going to rip their fucking leg off. And the, the ADA actually has that in there, that the dog needs to be, uh, you know, quiet, unobtrusive, and non-aggressive unless provoked. Somebody kicking my dog is provocation. I fully expect him to defend himself while at the same time I know I'll be defending him. So we're both going to get in trouble. But at the end of the day, assault my service dog, you're assaulting me. Okay. The law is written with the understanding, the implicit, it is not explicit. It's not spelled out the implicit understanding that dogs are living beings and that they are going to have bad days and that they are going to respond when they are provoked, just like a person. And the unrealistic expectation of robotic behavior that has been sold to the media by these organizations that are pushing for this is is perpetuating this whole kind of this magical mythology this mythos that service dogs are these robotically wonderful animals that won't ever do anything they're not supposed to and the reality of holding a leash day in and day out is it's a living being and how you the person holding the leash handle your dog determines how your dog behaves in public and if you're having a bad day and your dog sees it your dog could be a dog and take advantage of that and misbehave. If your dog's having a bad day and you holding the leash, don't see it and correct them or remove them from the situation. Okay. Under the ADA, the handler is responsible and the business has the right. If the handler, as the law says, is not taking immediate active, immediate effective action to correct that. Okay. The business has the right to say, please remove your dog. It's, it's um, not under your control. And every responsible handler who understands the law and understands their rights is going to go, you're absolutely right. I apologize. Be absolutely mortified and turn tail and get the, themselves and their dog out of there. Service dog handlers are not asking for anything special. We're not asking for to be treated special, just equal. And it's to say, look, grocery stores, if you've got a child screeching through the whole store, I've seen managers ask, hey, you guys are having a really bad day and it's causing a lot of problems. Would you mind coming back a little later? And, and a reasonable parent who's just, you know, at their wits end is like, yeah, this isn't working. And they turn around and leave. That's called being, a, you know, a responsible adult. It's the same thing with the dog. If your dog, I'm sorry, but 99.9% .9 of the service dogs that are actually service dogs that I've seen behave better than kids by far. <laughs> you know, well, really, you, you hit the dog, nail on the head there, JJ. You yeah, said it. Responsibility. So much, so much better behaved than your child. Yep. And yet I'm treated like the freak while your kid is screeching and throwing items off the shelves at people. Right. You know, and again, we're not looking for special treatment. We just want equal treatment. We just want the opportunity to be allowed to try and live our lives the same as everybody else. Yep. We require a dog to assist us with that. So how does, you know, if, if you don't have to have a permit for your kid, why do I have to have a permit for my dog? 
Right, exactly. Um, we do have to take a quick break for Live 365, but before we do, I'll ask everybody this question. That way they can think about it during the break, and we'll come back and we'll start with SCAV. What makes the AKC's Service Dog Pass program the ultimate and most dangerous registry? Please think about that on the other side of the break. We will discuss that. Like I said, we'll start with SCAV. You are tuned in to dvradio.net, WDVR. This is the roundtable discussions taking place on the Service Dog Show here Tonight, we'll be back right after this. The holiday season isn't always about physical gifts. Sometimes it is more than that. So during this holiday season, give to dvfarm.org. The DV Farm in Gilsom, New Hampshire is dedicated to helping addicted and homeless veterans get their lives back on track. Help them and let them know that they have a purpose and they are not alone. They watched your six when they volunteered. Now you can watch their six. Give to dvfarm.org today. Shooters Express is Charlotte's number one destination for all personal defense, sport, instruction, and recreational shooting supplies. They offer concealed carry classes for only $29.95. That's only $29.95 for concealed carry classes. And if you're military or law enforcement, you'll receive great deals and be eligible for even more at Shooters Express. So head over to Shooters Express in Belmont, North Carolina, or visit ShootersExpress.com for more information and monthly deals. That's Shooters Express in Belmont, North Carolina. This is not a endorsement from Shooters Express and is provided solely by DB Radio for your charge. DB Radio. And welcome back to the Roundtable Discussions here on WDVR, DVRadio.net. I'm Bo. I am the moderator for tonight's Roundtable Discussions. We have... Uh, PTS dog Joaquin Watai, Veronica Morris, and Brad. We have Scav and we have Nia with us. Before we went to break, I did ask everyone what makes the AKC's American Kennel Club Service Dog Pass program the ultimate and most dangerous registry. I said we'd start with Scav. Scav, what makes it the most uh, dangerous registry? I'm going to say the name. Hey, you got a front man like that. Uh, they're they're a powerhouse in the, in the show dog world. So, you know, just like any other organization out there, you got somebody with the power and the organization that they do. And now you have them leading the fight that we got them in with, you know, right in the middle of it. That's dangerous, dangerous for us. Understandable. Nia? Oh, you're muted. Hold on. There you go. <laughs> um, the name being the number one, it's it's a worldwide organization with, for not just, I, I mean, it's all of us. How many of us refer to AKC for every little thing? Uh, dog world related. Um, it's trusted. Um, what's particularly dangerous um, about them is that they also have a government relations department dedicated to lobbying for their interests and the interests of the dog world and service dogs are in that in their sphere so i and i don't i don't know if veronica um runs across them in the dot interactions that she has but i'm gonna take a wild guess and say they're probably at that table too lobbying specifically actually for airlines uh and the hospitality uh, industry to use their service dog pass um, as a standard and a requirement. So that that's very dangerous. Right. Um, that lobbying power. And we, we don't, as a service dog community, uh, that's not program related. There aren't uh, a whole lot of voices out there um, against these goliaths so uh we need more of those and we need to support the ones that do uh jj this is definitely the goliath <laughs> right jj same to you the service dog pass program why is it the ultimate and most dangerous registry obviously the cachet uh um included in the name akc american kennel club they're they are worldwide they're recognized um they have a large organization they have a large budget um and quite frankly I, I hate to sound cynical but at the end of the day what this might come down to is who's able to spend more money and the akc is going to beat the disabled handlers hands down every day of the week we just don't have the money we are by definition dis we live on on 
uh, fixed incomes. We don't have the ability to spend the cash that the AKC can. And so I, I foresee, should this be pursued without legislative assistance on the part, uh, on the side of disability rights, should this be pursued, they'll roll over us like a steamroller. And, and like I said earlier, the whole focus, everybody's focused on the wrong thing. Everybody's focused on the dog and nobody remembers that it's about the disabled handler person. It's about the person. And right. so what, what, we're, what we're facing right now is a knee-jerk reaction based on people's fears um, and trying to control what scares them um, at the cost of the uh, increase in ability that the use of a service dog uh, offers to their disabled handlers. The cachet behind the name is absolutely dangerous. The money that accompanies that cachet, uh, this is, this may come down to a very ugly fight. And um, I, it, when it comes down to it, quite frankly, and, and, and again, I hate sounding this cynical, but money talks in Washington, D.C. The, the guys with the money are the ones who get the policies. 100%. It's going um, to hurt us. Veronica and Brad, we've heard the name. We've heard the money. What to you guys makes the service dog pass program, again, the ultimate and most dangerous registry? Two things for me. One is that it's a pet dog organization. And going along with that, they have no background in disability rights. All they know is pet dogs. They don't know anything about disability rights. They don't know about how our dogs help us. They don't seem to understand the laws. Um, and a little extra thing in there, um, a lot of people think AKC testing is the only thing they can do in terms of testing their dogs, um, you know, in behavior along the progression from service dog and training to service dog. But um, for example, our organization has a service dog and training manners evaluation that you can take instead of sending AKC money for their CGC testing. Yeah, we don't make money off of that. <laughs> yeah, so, so there are other options. You don't have to pay AKC money to um, get evaluations for how your dog's training is going. And, and I'll add that we, I, I'm a little afraid about how this conversation is going because while big organizations with $90 million and name recognition can have a big impact, um, I'm worried about the other part of the group that's behind this because it's more behind the scenes. We're talking about big money in Washington. I'm worried a, a bit more about the people who have their, their um, tentacles into Washington because we actually met with one of the leaders behind the group, uh, the Association of Service Dog Providers for Military Veterans about four years ago when he was a congressional staffer. I'm not gonna name names, I, I don't, I'm not trying to call someone out, but I wanna give you a little perspective on it. So you've got people, more than one, um, who are with these service dog programs who have been congressional staffers, which means that they know about the levers of, gov of government to pull. They know how to, where to put their bills in to get laws passed and things like that. And now it's really hard to get a law passed. Um, but as a, as a quick intro, um, a lot of people don't realize this, like the Americans with Disabilities Act is an act. It's not the regulations. It doesn't talk about service dogs at all the stuff that all the specifics are in the regulations that come from an agency like Department of Justice or Department of Transportation. So that means that what, what's primary is the act of Congress. So if you wanted to force the Department of Justice to violate human rights and get and re rewrite something about service dogs, the most powerful way you can do that is you can get an act of Congress passed saying that they have to change something having to do with the ADA and it can start to mention service dogs and registries and what have you. So I'm worried that those people who are trying to pass like the PAWS Act, that they're going to do more and more and that they're going to lay the groundwork for undermining disability rights. Um, 
when we met with them, we tried hard to explain to them that there's another perspective, that they're coming into it not knowing anything about disability rights. And we said this in a friendly way. We, we said, look, we totally understand. We are angry too, that people are faking service dogs, but also there are people who are ignorant and need education. Um, maybe part of the problem is not that there aren't good laws in place, but that you need to educate people about the laws in place, or it doesn't matter what the laws are. So if you just introduce more and more things that are harder and harder on people with disabilities, hoping this will solve the problem, then what you're going to end up with is more confusion and more burdens for the people who are trying to do the right thing and more money in the pockets of the big corporations that we're being forced to go through to try to do the right thing. So in answer to the question about what we're, why is it the biggest threat, I think behind the scenes, it's those people who have a lot of power in DC to maybe pull those levers and get laws passed that we have very little power to lobby against. We're gonna do our best to keep fighting against it, but I think that what this is going to take from our part is not to go hide in the corner and think we can't do anything because they have money and they know people. We do have power. And what we have tried to do recently is start an education campaign where we are going to take some all the grassroots political pressure that we can exert and just educate the heck out of people and teach people that this is the wrong thing to do and that people who try to do this thing are doing the wrong thing and we need to tell them. So what we have under our site at uh, psych.dog slash AKC pass, that's P-S-Y-C-H dot D-O-G slash A-K-C pass. P-A-S-S. Yeah, not PAT like public access test, but PASS like service dog PASS. Um, we have a graphic that you can share to help educate people on social media. And we have all these steps that tell you what you can easily do fr from your own home to exert this pressure, this power that you do have to help change things. Because if we do that, especially if we get to people first, we are going to frame how they think about this issue before AKC has the chance and the Association of Service Dog Providers for Military Veterans has the chance to frame the issue in their own terms and get people's knee-jerk reactions to go along with that. Right. Um, if, I, if I might tag on to that, Bo, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more, Brad. There are people involved in the association whose ultimate goal um, – uh, and we, you know, we alluded to this the last time we talked. Um, uh, Assistance Dog International tried this a number of years ago, and they've been successful on the state level. Um, Assistance Dogs International managed to change legal language in a lot of state laws to say assistance dogs instead of service dogs. That 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 introduced confusion that was beneficial to ADI because it opened up the doors for uh, the inclusion possibly of uh, emotional support animals in public access type situations because of, because of the confusion about the wording. Um, ADI also managed to get their foot in the door with the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, via Secretary Shinseki, I believe, who was given an ADI organization trained service dog and along with the, the, the gift of the dog convinced that, oh, hey, this is the way, way to go. This is if, if the, uh, if the uh, VA is going to provide service dog for veterans, they got to come from these guys. And they got their foot in the door and it became policy in the federal record, um, which is the nuts and bolts. It's the, it's the actual action of the law. The Association of Service Dog Providers for Military Veterans is trying to replace ADI in that position of this is who the, the VA will pay to give you a dog. I'm torn about that because ADI is not an American organization. It is a foreign uh, entity. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, they have no business. A foreign co country's organization should have no business being a part of U.S. Veterans Affairs Department policy. It sh if they were going to say dogs have to have certain qualifications in order for us to pay for it, they should have used an American standard. They should have used the AKC from the very get-go. Um, however, 
the the whole the, the whole concept of well this is how if you qualify because your dog came from this organization then we're going to provide uh benefits for you meaning health insurance and equipment for your dog um the you know the the whole concept is, it ignores the fact that veterans disabled veterans are citizens of the united states and we have the same rights protected by the ada as any other american citizen and it completely ignores it and said, well, you have those rights, but we're only going to pay you and help you with exercising your right if you jump through our hoops. And the Association of Service Dog Providers for Military Veterans is trying to replace ADI as that organization. So in, in, in one way, that's good because at least they're replacing it with an American standard and an American organization. But at the same time, all you're doing is trading one bad situation for another. Um, and uh, that's that's a problem because you're still putting this cap and limiting veterans and limiting the access they should have to benefits. Um, th that being said, the other part of that equation is I don't want the VA involved in my service dog in any way, shape or form. It's hard enough to get the health care that I do get. Um, I don't want I don't want their their filthy uh, gubernatorial uh freaking bureaucratic fingers involved in my dog it, it shouldn't have it, the only involvement they should have is is your dog behaving go about your day have a good day you know is that a service dog what tasks is it trained to perform just like the law allows that should be the only involvement they have so uh, on the one hand kicking adi out of the va is a, is a great idea on the other hand it's going to end up costing veterans and once they get their their it's a wet these people are working with wedges once they get the wedge in the va then they're going to aim that wedge at the Department of Justice and the ADA, and and the the and the first step, the, the VA is the second largest budget in the U.S. government. It is the largest bureaucracy, and once they get that wedge in the VA, they can say, "Well, we have X, you know, billion number of dollars," saying our organization is is the way to go. You know, the VA says we're the way to go. So, Department of Justice, we should change. The ADA, because look, look, we have this backing, you know, we have, here's the evidence that what we say works because the VA is paying us, not ADI. This, this is, again, I hate, you know, it sounds like I should put on my tinfoil hat, but there is a cabal and it's aimed at, it's aimed at disabled rights and it's aimed at the wrong thing. Disabled people are going to suffer because they're, they're, it's a knee jerk reaction. They're focused on the emotional lead, which is fake service dogs and they're not focused on the rights of the disabled and this is this is absolutely terrifying and you're right i don't mean to sound like well we can't do anything i will look i'm only a six and a half hour drive from washington dc if i have to get my truck at four in the morning to be at a hearing by by noon i will do it every single time i have to but that costs us that's going to be hard it is going to be a battle and i think we have to be very realistic that should things progress the way they're going, we do have a fight. We have a very big fight and it's going to be difficult. And, and you know, for, for lack of any other better terminology, we best gird our loins because we're going to war. We, once this starts, once this ball starts rolling and you know what? Disabled people and specifically disabled service dog handlers are a very minor minority. We're one of the smallest of the minorities. Um, we will get steamrolled if we're not aware that that's exactly what they're trying to do to us. We will absolutely get steamrolled. We need to be on top of that. We need to be ready. Uh, and and the, the work that you guys are doing, I, I can't commend enough with the Department of Transportation. Um, and honestly, this, this whole service dog pass concept uh, couldn't have come at a worse time as you guys seem to be finally turning a corner and making some progress with the Department of Transportation and the ACAA. And all of a sudden, here comes the AKC throwing in this flaming spitter, you know, curveball. Oh, hey, we're, hey, we got a solution for everybody. And no, this is a solution for AKC organizations to make lots of money. But this doesn't solve a damn thing for the actual person with the leash in their hand who needs that dog beside them. This is, this is, this is scary. There is a cabal. And, it, and, and their whole goal is to take away our rights so that they can make a profit. If you're just tuning in live, this is DD Radio 
Net. We're having a roundtable discussions in place of the Service Dog Show tonight. We're talking about the American Kennel Club and this ID registry and, and all of that BS. Uh, we've got a short question that uh, Brad sort of touched on a little bit in his thoughts last uh, that I wanted to get to before we get to this uh, next, the, the question originally uh, up next, because it is a little bit uh, drawn out. But uh, Neo, we'll start with you. How could the fake service dog problem be addressed that would not infringe on the rights of disabled people? Um, I'm sorry. Can you can you repeat that again? I yeah, not a problem. How could the fake service dog problem be addressed that would not infringe on the rights of those disabled people? Of disabled uh, okay. people, excuse me. Um, education. I think um, practical solutions that get to the root of the problem so we can get real chance of influencing people to um, interact better with each other. Um, because this, this problem is very multifaceted and all stakeholders need to be well aware of not just how the interaction should be, but also understand the uh, in depth the needs of the disabled and why um, things are the way that they are. So for me, you know, I think of things like in my state, for example, as a landlord, every lease that I sign has to be include education about a couple of things. Some is city codes, one is bed bugs. Like it's a requirement. I have to educate that person. So I think of things like, I think we should focus on laws that require every commercial real estate transaction, every lease that's signed, every doctor that writes a letter um, be required to provide education with that transaction and educate stakeholders on how to properly interact and deal with it. Because people want registries because they think it's going to eliminate the problem of bad um, dogs in public. Well, there's bad service dogs in public too. And the businesses that are out there are uncomfortable with how to properly do interactions with us. And people are uh, afraid to interact with us as well sometimes. And 75 to 85% of those situations that I personally have run into and worked with in the last three and a half years has been under-informed, misinformed, are completely uninformed stakeholders in the transaction. So educate and not regulate. Make it a requirement that people understand, like Brad said earlier, we need people to understand how these laws work and how to use them and how to be practical with them in the day-to-day -day structure. So that's how I see um, the most effective way. And if you doubt it, um, smoking, rates have gone down due to to education campaigns i'm an 80s child we grew up with mad sad every ad to combat drunk driving and those numbers did go down the war on drugs the most effective um uh, uh, approach uh, on the war on drugs was always the education part the other parts the border um uh, you know crossing um, and, and other stuff that they did was less effective. So education works. It's slower, but it works. And if we focused on that, we, I think we'd have a lot better results and a lot healthier uh, relationships with people. Right. Uh, JJ, same to you. How, can, uh, how could the fake service dog problem be addressed that would not infringe on the rights of disabled people? Um. Education, education, education is it, it, the most powerful tool we have is accurate education. Um, the, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I, I foresee crowds of service dog handlers <clears throat> on the Capitol steps shouting, Ed educate, don't legislate. I love it, Nia. I think you just, you just gave us our rally cry. Educate, don't legislate, educate, don't legislate. <laughs> I just say educate, don't regulate, but yeah, that one works too. <laughs> legislate, regulate, either way, yeah, regulate. Yeah. Educate, but educate, educate, educate. Educate, educate. The bottom line is 
misinformation, disinformation, intentional disinformation, mm -hmm. and lack of information. Um, and the only way you can combat all three of those is accurate education. Uh, it's the whole reason the PTS dog exists. My life mission became, after I started training and handling my dog, I, I, I recognized that people just didn't understand anything about service dogs. They didn't know, businesses didn't know they had rights. Handlers, other handlers, veterans with service dogs from these great organizations didn't have a clue about the law, didn't understand that, that they had rights and that they, that, you know, that when people said, well, you can't bring that dog in here, that they had not only rights, but recourse. They, they didn't know. Um, the whole reason I wrote a book about PTSD service dogs is because I kept running into veterans who had absolutely no reference and didn't even know where to start to look. They didn't understand the law. And I am not opposed to the Association of Service Dog Providers for Military Veterans setting a standard of training that they expect their member organizations to provide. As long as what they're doing is regulating their member organizations, not their clientele. If you want to say we want to make sure that dogs that come from our organizations do X, Y, and Z, and you're providing the money to make sure they have that training, make whatever rules you, you want. That, but when you start imposing your rules, your organizational rules on individuals, and that imposition interferes in their needs and in their rights, we have a problem. And they've gone, and, and that's, that's where I have, that's where my biggest disappointment is and, and my biggest concern is, is look, make all the rules you want for your member organizations. Look, if you're going to train service dogs and call yourself part of us, you have to do X, Y, and Z. That's perfectly fine. But when you start imposing artificial requirements on disabled handlers, you've crossed the line and you're not <coughs> serving that client. You're trying to control them. And that's where this is headed is is that we're going to have to ask permission to be treated equally and and i want to touch on one phrase from the email that really kind of sent me over the edge as far as how frustrated i am with this the akc emails explained that this service dog pass was going to enable access providers to better do their job whose job is it exactly to make sure that they provide access to disabled people. The entire implication of that idea is that disabled people aren't equal and we have to bend over backwards and do something special for them. None of us that I, as far as I know, the, 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 the disabled people who I'm in communication with, we're not asking for special, special treatment or special, special access. We're just asking for the opportunity of equal access. So exactly who is, who is the disabled concierge, you know, whose job is to provide, is, is to ensure obsequiously that they provide this access for these disabled people. Like, you know, we're walking around with gold gilding on our bodies or something. This is insult. This is an insulting idea. I don't want to be, I don't want special treatment. I just want to be allowed to go about my life in whatever you know, capacity that I am able to do so to the best of my ability, using the equipment necessary for me to do so. Mine happens to be a service dog. It could, as easily, it could just as easily be a prosthetic or a chair or a cane or hearing aids. I, nobody needs to bend over backwards to provide me with access. The, the whole conceptualization behind the idea it literally relegates disabled people to a secondary position as citizens. And oh, that's wrong. Really quick, JJ, before I let Nia chime in a little bit, uh, I know a lot of people aren't going to agree with this, and I really don't care because they're not in most of our positions. But you and I have talked about this offline, about uh, how they want to regulate and registries and, and all this bullshit. But um, I think you said it best that day, me and you were talking – this is a reiteration of the civil rights. It really is. When you get down to the brass tacks, they're treating us as lower 
class citizens at the end of the day and basically saying you're going to do what we say like it or not we don't care uh what you need what your needs uh are at the end of the day so screw you you got to listen to us because we're we we've got the ball in our court uh like i said a lot of people won't like that and they'll disagree with me because they're not in our uh position but that's my thoughts on that yeah the term you're looking for is ableism Yes. And it's just three letters. Just take the three letters, the first three letters of racism and replace race with ableism. It's exact same uh, bigotry. It, it, it is literally the exact same bigotry. And if I don't you, say that lightly at all. I don't want anybody to you know, take my words and say, hey, he's comparing the rights of disabled people to black folk and, and Hispanics. But, but, I'm not doing that trying, at all. They're trying to control disabled handlers in a very similar way. It's exactly. the same as saying you can only ride in the back of the bus because of the color of your skin or because right. you have a wheelchair, you have a service dog. It's the same thing. Right. It's um, it's it's over ability rather than color, but there's no difference in the idea behind it. But really quick, Nia, you had something to tack on before I go to Veronica and Brad with the same thing. Um, I just wanted to you know, while we're having this discussion and people think um, that registries are this this um, magic solution, um, there's a couple of things that people need to keep in mind about them as well is they are voluntary, right? So unless everybody's doing it, it's going to do nothing, okay? And we live in such a policing culture that people feel like they need to regulate what we're doing because they think where the problem and so if we're if people the stakeholders the public people the gatekeepers the managers at the stores we're they're creating registries to solve problems because one stakeholder is not doing their part in this in this world right um the bit, number one complaint is the public issues with um out of control dogs or non-compliant teams well, there's a remedy for it. We need to focus on making sure that the people who have those remedies know how to use it and know how to use it confidently because we don't need registries to regulate non-compliant teams. The public access uh, stakeholders are doing their part in removing them. And that's one, of, that's one of the bigger issues I think that we face that people think registries will solve and they won't. But I will tell you what they do and what people don't always think about is it puts us in danger. My personal experience with being asked about a registry involved a four hour standing wait in a hotel lobby, talking to the hotel's lawyers and almost put me in the hospital because they wanted a registry. So we got to keep that in mind as we're having these discussions is, Policing the disabled people is not going to help. It's going to hurt. And the people that do need to help are not comfortable doing it. And we need to focus on that. So education, education, education is always the best solution, I think. Most definitely. Brad and Veronica, how could the fake service dog problem be addressed that would not infringe on the rights of disabled people? Well, I'm going to have a kind of controversial answer to that. And that is, stop talking about the fake, and I'm using air quotes, fake service dog problem. Because most of the time that I go out that I see poorly behaved dogs, they're not fake service dogs. They're someone with a disability whose dog is having a bad day. Or somebody who doesn't understand the level of training that needs to happen. It's not, there aren't all these like millions of people out there saying, Ooh, I'm gonna, I mean, there are some, but most of them are not out there saying, I'm gonna pull one over and everyone, and I'm gonna fake my dog as a service dog. Also, it's extremely ableist, and I'm so glad you brought that word up. It's extremely ableist to be out there crying fake service dog all the time. It puts people with disabilities on the, the spotlight. We are now all of a sudden being looked at as if we are fakers by default. And we have to prove that we're legitimate people with disabilities. Instead of being accepted as people with disabilities, just like any other person that wants to go to a store, we're assumed, oh, you must be one of those fakers out there. So I think we should stop talking about the 
fake service dog problem, and we should talk about what it actually is, a problem of disruptive or destructive dogs, which may or may not be actually trained to assist someone with their disability. They may or may not be having a bad day. They may or may not be perfectly trained. But what we need to do is, um, is, is stop all these news articles inflaming people's ideas and, and making people think that they want to do this. We need to accept the fact that, that there are many more legitimate service dogs out there that may be having a bad day or the owners may not understand the the community standards of training as opposed to what the ada minimally requires which is just not being disruptive or destructive so i'll turn it over to brad right and and i'm happy to jump on the the education bandwagon you know that's like one of the primary things that pstp does um but i want to give an example of something that will help take this in, in another direction. So I'll start off with the bad and then I'll try to transition to the good direction. While I have a couple of friends um, at CCI, a very large, well-known service dog um, program, they have put things out there that, that like petitions for people to sign, which are then followed up by a fundraiser, of course, um, gotta make money. Uh, and the, their petitions say fake service dogs are everywhere. And this is part of the problem. I, I had to write in response to that in an article called There Are No, there are no Fake Vests because they were trying to prohibit the online sale of, of service dog paraphernalia, which isn't good for any of us. Um, but wh what the issue is, is that you have a lot of people who are running these programs who don't have the disability rights background, they don't know about the human rights issues that we've been talking about because we, we've thought about them more. Um, and they are, uh, I'll just say, indoctrinating the people who follow them, the general public, and the people who get dogs from their programs. And they give them these views that are devoid of, of civil rights. And that's the bad. What I want to say is the good, because there is a positive spin on this. We've been working to form coalitions, and this is slow work over many years, but we've been working to develop relationships with, with people in these organizations and with other user groups, like especially with people who get guide dogs from programs, um, so that we, through both their members, the, the people who use guide dogs and other kinds of service dogs, and through the people who work for these programs, get to know other perspectives and stop pushing that kind of view that turns the public into the disability police that puts everyone under the spotlight. So the key word here, uh, the word of the day kids is solidarity. We wanna work to increase solidarity because it's so easy for us to get pissed off at everyone and say, these people are the problem, this person and this person this program and this program, they're doing the wrong thing. We don't want to do that. We think that the best way forward is to gather as much power around ourselves, not just ourselves, but all, everyone here, everyone listening, the whole community, gather power by bringing people along, along for the ride, telling them a story, saying how this impacts you and why you want them to change the way they're doing, just give them, giving them a nudge at a time. Because the more we scream at people and divide the community because someone isn't familiar, they haven't gone through the same stuff that we have, the more you're going to create these schisms that make it easier for a large corporation to divide us and conquer us. So what I want to encourage everyone to do is say, yeah, I'm pissed off, but the face I'm going to present to these people who are pissing me off is, hey, friend, I think we could do better here's why, here's what I think we could do so that we're not punishing people with disabilities who don't deserve to be published, to deserve to be punished. So I, I hope that that solidarity message will get through because I'll be straightforward with you. It's not because it's, it's not fun for me to, to hate on people. Hey, that's fun too. But it's because this is a long-term strategy. If we're going to do good in the world, we need to get everyone on board we can. We need to get all the power we can and maybe not everyone's gonna agree with all the fine points, but if we can get some, you know, most people to agree with the big points, 
then we are going to have that power. We're going to get 2,000 people to sign our petition, and we're going to be able to go to, to agencies like DOT or legislators and say, look, we've got thousands of people behind us who are actually impacted by this. And if you pass this law, we're going to have all these stories that say so-and-so passed this law that hurt people with disabilities, even though we warned them not to, even though we had thousands of people telling them they shouldn't have done that. So let's work together. I think we just found our Mr. Rogers for all of this, everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> Scav, uh, your thoughts about how could uh, the fake service dog problem be addressed that would not infringe on the rights of disabled people? And as most of uh, everybody else has said, no dog is fake uh, when it comes to service dog because they didn't ask for it. We've had JJ, yourself, Nia, uh, uh, Jaeger Foundation, and, and almost everybody that's been on uh, has said there is no fake service dog. So how could that problem be addressed in your thoughts, uh, Scav? Yeah, I'm going to go right along with them with the education. And uh, the younger, the better. Um Luckily, I had young ones, a daughter, when Scout came on board. And by going back and forth to school, uh, those kids went home and told them their parents all about Scout. And, and from there, they actually educated their parents about service dogs and the ADA. And that kind of spread forth. So that little community up there got, a, got an education a little bit better than the general public, but the, the whole fake thing, it, it's, it's not going to go away. It's just like the handicap parking. Uh, how many times have you gone somewhere and seen a, a, a car and it's the disabled spot that doesn't have a disabled sticker or a placard. It, people are going to do what they're going to do. Yep. Whether it's a registered dog, non-registered dog, they're going to do what they want to do. It's human nature to, to lie, cheat, and steal. If they can get away with something on, on the back of a handicapped person, they're going to get away with it. 100%. Um, I want to go over to this next question. It's, it's more than I, I had planned on asking in one question, but if you'll, if you'll stick with me, uh, I'll ask the first part of it. And then once you give me your thoughts on it, uh, we'll go on to the second part for each one of you, obviously. Uh, so try not to make it too much of a novel with your answers, if you don't mind. But if this passes, are parents and guardians of autistic and special needs people going to be required to go through the same kind of testing as, say, my dog, uh, for example, to prove they are functioning at the behavioral standards required and not faking it now before you guys answer i want to make sure that everybody that's listening understands we're not against any persons with autism or special needs that have a reason to have a service dog so i want to get that clear right away um jj we'll start with you okay so this question this question is a little tricky um essentially what this this question is is okay so you're going to test my service dog are you going to test people who are caregivers um, you know, what standard are they being held to? You're, you're testing me and my service dog. Are you testing, you know, an autistic child's parents to make sure they understand how to handle the, the, their child's disability appropriately? Um, and, and that's, you know, what, that's a good point is, is no, the dog is not a person. We get that. But who, where, you know, where does this end? I think is the question. Where is this going to end? First, we take on the service dog handlers. Okay. But that opens the door because now we're regulating them. Okay, so yeah, who is regulating the parents of autistic people or, you know, ch uh, children with uh, uh, multiple sclerosis or some of these horrible diseases? Who's making sure they're doing their job right? Maybe we should start trying to control them. And it, 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 this is a slippery slope. I go back to the illustration of the Second Amendment. It's a slippery slope. Once you start nipping away at rights, you start taking bigger bites and bigger bites. And all of a sudden it gets to the point where, no, you don't have rights. You don't have any rights. The government's going to regulate everything you do. This is a slippery slope. Um, and uh, 
I, I you know, uh, I, I say this repeatedly. I absolutely refuse to endorse or support any uh, m- any movement that removes rights from disabled people. We had to fight to guarantee to get the law passed that protects those rights. It, the law does not grant us those rights. It protects our rights. And there was a fight to get that done. And it started with the civil rights movement. Heck, it started before then. Um, and people died to guarantee civil rights. And the ADA is part of that civil rights movement. Um, so when we start taking those rights away and limiting them and regulating them, th- this is a slippery slope and it goes in one direction. And we've seen it in other countries in the past and it didn't go well for disabled people at all. Okay, with that, JJ, before uh, we move on and get the thoughts of everybody else, uh, why are physically disabled handlers the only ones being singled out and where could the energy of the organizations be better focused rather than taking on the rights, uh, taking the rights of disabled people away? Physically disabled handlers are, are not the only ones being singled out. More so, I think, uh, psychiatric uh, disabilities um, are the ones who are being singled out. You don't look disabled is a phrase that we hear. Why do you, ha- you don't look disabled. Why do you have that doc? Okay. And it goes back again to mentality. Um, we absolutely, I absolutely agree with you, Veronica. This phrase fake service dog has got to disappear from the American vernacular. It is wrong. There's no such thing as a fake dog. No dog wakes up in the morning and thinks, I'm going to put my vest on and go to the grocery store and and bark at everybody. The dog is not the problem. We're focused on the wrong thing. This This is absolutely a smoke and mirrors game being played by a group of people who want to gain control. And they are controlling the narrative by broadcasting this fake service dog concept. And the last time I checked, unless it's a cat with fucking ears strapped to it and a tail, you know, and a funky tail, there's no such thing as a fake dog. It's a dog. The dog is not the problem. We're looking at the dog and we're missing the person. The issue resides in the person holding the leash. And the issue is either lack of knowledge, incomplete knowledge, or enough knowledge to be able to push themselves fraudulently. And education of all parties, of all the stakeholders is Nia says, education of the person holding the leash, education of the doorkeeper, of the gatekeeper, education on a corporate level, education, look, there's one version of the Pause Act that is one sentence And when you read it and it says uh, that the uh, VA is going to provide service dogs for people with PTSD, that's the, that's the sentence. There's literally a version of the pause act. There's four on the, in, in the, in the committee right now in the uh, department uh, in the, in the uh, veterans affairs committee. And one just says the VA is going to provide service dogs for people with PTSD. Well, when you go in and read the federal register and the VA regulations, the VA regulations already say that. The VA has taken it upon themselves to make a decision on how they're going to do that, which is in most cases not doing that, but it's actually already in the federal register and it's already part of VA policy. The VA has just chosen not to follow their own rules. But when you think about the fact that it's already, that almost the exact wording is already in the federal record. And then you look at the fact that a congressman from, uh, I believe it was Minnesota, um, but I may be wrong, put in a bill. And he said when he put in the bill, I'm tired of this, I'm pushing, while everybody's uh, distracted by all this other stuff going on in the, in the House, I'm going to just push this bill through. And he didn't take the time to do a little bit of research or have one of his people do some research and figure out that almost word for word, what he's trying to pass as a bill and calling the Pause Act already exists in the Federal Register as part of the official policy of the Department of Veterans Affairs. There's a disconnect. There is a, there is a huge disconnect between all the stakeholders. And the only way to solve that disconnect and, and resolve the confusion is education. If we don't yep. teach everybody involved accurately, nobody's going to gain anything. 
100%. Veronica, Brad, same question over to you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and answer both parts in the same answer, if that's okay. That That's perfectly fine. Do it how you're more comfortable with. Okay. So um, I think as to the first part, um, if uh, parents and guardians of people with autism need to be go through testing to um, say that they can handle their children, just like we can handle <laughs> our dogs, um, it reminds me of ugly laws. If you aren't familiar with ugly laws, these were laws that were, were in act not too long ago, not too long before the ADA, that said things like people with disabilities can't go out in public because they're too disruptive, they're too ugly, they, you know, they're not fit for being in public. Right. And I just don't think that's right at all. I think that we should not be focusing on differences. I think we should be focusing on the on what makes us human. And we should be focusing on how we can all participate in society equally. So if a person, let's say I have some friends with autism who um, stem a lot, who, uh, you know, like do repetitive motions or like rock back and forth to help themselves manage the stimulus in the outside world. And if someone needs to do that to be in the grocery store, fine. I don't care. It's not a big deal. And then as to the second part, um, I think that there's, I think it should have been psychiatrically disabled handlers, not physically disabled handlers being the one singled out. Um, I have actually read um, a lot of the uh, paperwork from a certain organization, well, I'll just go ahead and say it, ADI, um, and they really do single out people with psychiatric disabilities. And um, if you're a, a member organization of ADI and you want to provide, uh, let's say, for example, PTSD dogs or any type of psychiatric service dog, the person getting the dog has to go through an evaluation to make sure that they're not going to have anger management problems. They don't require that for any other type of disability of a person getting a service dog. They're stigmatizing people with mental illness, saying that we are unfit in some way. We're, we're inherently not good and not able to take care of dogs. Um, it, it's really bad. And as to what um, the organizations could, should be focused on rather than taking away the rights of disabled people, it's very simple education. And I'm not going to harp on that anymore because this show is very long. <laughs> but everyone else has said very well, focus on education, 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 not what is it? Regulation. <laughs> right. We're, we're, we will finish up with Scav and Nia, and then we'll go into final statements. Scav, really quick, the same question over to you. Oh, wait, Brad wanted to say something. Oh, about okay. Me. I'm sorry. I thought, I'm sorry. Well, sometimes she speaks for me, but not always. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so a lot of people don't realize that when there is a behavioral problem, like some someone is, and, and people with autism aren't just children, by the way. A lot of people have that as their idea. They grow up and they are adults. So it, let's imagine that someone, an adult person with autism, uh, is running around hitting people. Okay. There's a remedy for that that has nothing to do with disability. It's the same thing that you would do if someone else <laughs> without autism were running around hitting people. Now, there are issues with calling cops and crisis intervention training, all that, but let's not get into that. That you know, We have laws in place to protect people. Um, and I wanted to point out some of the other history just really fast about t requiring people uh, to use paperwork to travel. You know, we're talking about a country, the, the USA, where we are supposed to have certain rights like freedom, freedom of movement. Now, there was a time in our history where people who weren't considered full people were required to carry around pa paperwork to legitimize themselves and be able to travel. Um, and, you know, I don't want to get into the details. This is going to be pretty controversial, but there was also, I don't use this lightly, let's talk about Hitler in Germany and armbands and stars and forcing people to carry paperwork to travel because they were considered less than human. Um, and I bring that example up not to inflame passions because whenever someone mentions Hitler, oh, they must be going to extremes. A lot of people forget that some of the first people that Hitler went after 
were people with disabilities because they were considered unfit to be in society. They weren't part of the eugenics program. And it's just like the ugly laws and the stigma in the U.S. that ran all the way up until the ADA, and are, some are still on the books today, haven't been stricken in localities. So when we're talking about um, taking, making sure that people have their disability rights and their freedom of movement and treating people equally as far as access goes, this is not something that's old. This is a fight that's not old and that we're still fighting today. And if we don't keep up that fight, we don't live in some utopia. Rights can and will be rolled back. So that's mm -hmm. why I encourage people to you know, go participate with organizations, share social media graphics like we've been talking about that we put out there. And this, there has to be an actual way that you educate and you be a part of the fight we can't just say, yay, education, that's great. We need to do something. So please do yep. something. Yes, yes. Scav, uh, your thoughts on the same questions. Okay. Um, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, people would have been locked up for in insane asylums for that kind of stuff. Um, the ugly laws. Uh if you would have cheated on your husband or wife, you could have been locked up for that kind of stuff. So, you know, uh, maybe us as dis disabled people with service dogs would have been locked up because we're not full people. And and then like Brad and Veronica were talking about, we, we've been fighting and fighting and fighting. And it's come to that point where if we, we don't keep fighting, it, we're giving up and it's going to reverse itself. So, you know, it's, it's kind of insane. That's why I brought up the insane asylums. Um, we don't have the insane asylums anymore because we become more civilized. We don't throw, you know, the, the people with autism or the people that have cheated on their husbands and wives or the, the people with service dogs in the insane asylums anymore. But maybe these people coming up with these stupid ass laws need to be <laughs> thrown in these insane asylums. Uh, it, it just baffles my mind that uh, why are we doing this? You know, why do we keep coming up with these damn registries? Uh, all you got to do is look at history, right? Every, every every time we register something, somebody else is either wiped off the face of the earth or gets hurt. Uh, the second part of your question, I've got two handicaps that you can't see. So when somebody looks at me and I don't answer their question, or, you know, they're like, hey, why do you have that dog? There's nothing physically wrong with you, and I don't answer them. We've gone over this on my page, and I've talked to a couple of people out about it. Um, it. It gets me into some extreme conversations out there, uh, usually some name callings or whatever, because number one, I can't hear them talking to me. <laughs> uh, number two, you know, the PTSD thing. Right. So I don't know what they want. You know, I don't have to lose a leg or be put in a wheelchair or, or whatnot. We got these dogs for for our needs. I don't know what I'd do with, without Scout because I hell last week he saved me from getting hit by another car. You know I don't I don't hear these things. So you don't have to be physically deformed to to need assistance. Right. Before we go on to Nia with this, and then like I said, go on to final thoughts. I think a big misconception where most of the misconceptions come from, in my opinion, over the years, is not just these organizations that are popping up. But entertainment, movies, TV, media, you don't see a lot of people with PTSD and hearing loss and stuff like that with service dogs. Most of them have a physical handicap, and that's what you see, and that's what we misconcept as, hey, that's the only way someone must be disabled because they're physically disabled. Uh, Nia, yourself. So for the first question... Um if this passes our parents and guardians of artistic, you know, I think when you 
start trying to tell other people how to manage their very personal and very unique needs, you're always going to be um, doing a disservice. And the longer that I've been disabled and the longer I work and advocate for our community, I realize that there are no absolutes and that we need to look for, like Veronica said, the more commonality between all of the organizations. Because I do believe that when try and do these things, that they have good intentions, but we all know how what good intentions are paved with, right? Um, so I think that people, and we keep repeating it, is having a better understanding of dis of the disability paradigm, the disability uh, groups' needs, and psychiatrics. The psychiatric service dog community is extremely unique within the bigger community, right? Because a lot of these rules, what, who are the people that um, the, the greater majority is going to be the invisible disability community that's targeted by the little interference that is allowable by ADA and FHA, for example, right? Um, so I think it, what can organizations do or should focus on is building systems to support the laws that are already there. We already have our protections. Um, they're already there. Remedies already exist. We need a better supportive structure. These people's focus should be focused on, you know, um, organizations and coalitions that do support that gatekeeper, that do support that landlord, that do support that doctor. Because those stakeholders working together knowledgeably are where we will benefit the disabled community the most. So especially psychiatric where it's invisible, we got to get letters. Our dogs are treated different at the airlines. Our dogs, um, we're looked at differently. We're stigmatized differently. So that's where I think focus should be is the system itself changing its viewpoint, getting a better understanding of what we need and how to get better solutions to accomplish it. And Brad and Veronica's work is a great example of how that, you know, that can happen. Right. Uh, we are about 10 minutes from 10 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Holy shit. Right. Um, right. So with that said, let's go over final thoughts from each and every one of you. JJ, starting with you, brother. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody who joined the panel. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time and going long. Uh, this is a difficult subject. This is a frustrating subject for those of us who are the ones with the leash in our hands. Um, and I think it's important as a community that we <coughs> take the time to have discussions like this because uh, a lot of the times um, we do, part, we bury our heads in the sand. It's easier not to think about it and just ignore it because it's taxing. It's, you know, it's wearing with, with psychiatric disabilities, with PTSD, depression, anxiety, it can be very hard to deal with and communicate about these kind of things. So I really would like to thank you very much for joining us and uh, helping to kind of air this out a bit. Um, I think it's important, especially appreciate uh, Veronica and Brad, your uh, historical perspective. Uh, and a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of the history, um, I'm still investigating and still learning. Um, to be honest, I'd never heard of ugly laws, but now that you said it out loud, it makes sense. And I'm going, oh yeah, you know what? You're right. Um, I think uh, specifically of laws that are still in the book. If you really want to get upset, read Pennsylvania's white cane laws. <laughs> if, if, if you're, it's, I mean, you know, there are still laws on the books that are for lack of any better terminology, ass fucking backwards. And um, we, we can only tackle so many of these at once. And Honestly, most of those laws were put into place out of a lack of understanding on the, on the part of the people who made the laws. Um, don't give up the fight. Don't stop educating. But you know what? If you're not able to educate, at least make, make friendships and make alliances with people who do have that ability and people who you can pick up the phone and message or text or call and say, I need, I need your help. Um, because there are those of us out out here who do have the ability and who 
spend a lot of time doing everything we can to advocate and to educate. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help, please. Yes, yes, most definitely. Veronica, Brad, final thoughts. Sure. So I, well, so I, I want to encourage people to, um, of course, try to keep up with this stuff. Uh, you know, you can do that partly through uh, finding psychiatric service dog partners on Facebook and Twitter. Um, also, I'll redirect you to uh, psych.dog, that's P-S-Y-C-H dot D-O-G um, slash A-K-C pass, P-A-S-S. Um, and that will, will help direct you to the, some of the easy things that you can do. And I don't, I don't want to put the message out there that if you have a disability, you have to take on the world and do everything. Everyone needs to find their niche. But that's why we try to make it so that if you're up for doing something, we give you a selection and you can pick what best suits you. And then you can feel good that you did something in the fight um, because doing something is a heck of a lot better, better than doing nothing. So I, I hope you'll join us. And I would just like to say, I guess in conclusion, that I uh, hope that everyone has learned some of the reasons um, who were thinking maybe this sounded good, or the AKC service dog pass sounded good, or anything like that. I hope you learned some of the reasons why um, it isn't the solution that people think it is. Um, I think that it's important to learn about ableism um, and understand how requiring documentation and identification for people with disabilities to go about their daily lives is wrong. It's ableist. It's against civil rights, which disability rights is civil rights. Um, the ADA is civil rights law. Um, there's actually, if you're interested, there's a movie that details some of the people who helped um, get the ADA started. What's it called? Mm -hmm. I, I think there's, the sound of something. I wasn't able to find it in time, sorry. Um, anyway, there, there's a movie out there that, that you can look up that, that hit, details some of the history of ADA law um, that is very good to watch. Um, and I would just finally like to encourage people to stop with the fake, in quotes, service dog stuff. Um, you know, I think we should look to um, each other as equals. Maybe dogs are having a bad day, but... Um, you know, I think that that, you know, we need to stop trying to accuse everyone of having a fake service dog. The media needs to stop accusing everyone of having a fake service dog. And we need to just be accepting and educate people about the laws. 100 you know, It's called The Music Within. The new movie is called The Music Within. Awesome. I'll, I'll try to put a link to that in the description of the podcast and when we get the video out. Scav, I know it's, you know, way past your bedtime, your final oh. thoughts on everything we spoke about tonight. Yeah. Um, I just want to, you know, you're an army guy and we need all our brothers and sisters to, to stand with us and, and take this one out. Um, the more we have out there with us side by side, the bigger the fight can get, you know. And this is going to be a big fight because me, by myself, I can't do it. JJ, by himself, he can't do it. But two of us, you know, that that's a little bit better. And then you add uh, Veronica and Brad, that's even better. You add Nia, and it just goes from there. So is the, the bigger the network gets, the more people we can reach, the better we can educate. So hopefully everybody spreads the word and, you know, the, and maybe even we get inside the AKC's head, you know, and let them know we're not going to take this one laying down. Right. 110%. Nia, your final thoughts about this roundtable discussions? Um, my final thoughts and commentary is going to be to all service dog handlers, whether it's guide dog, mobility, psyche, it doesn't matter if you rely on an animal as your medical equipment. Um, check out ADA network um, websites. 
learn about what your rights are and how these laws are meant to be used on your behalf. Because our community does need to kind of rally around and get together. We may not totally agree on every single detail, but we all agree that we don't want our protections to be uh, burdened any further and to improve people's outlooks about animals as medical equipment. So understand your own rights and we need to help other people understand them as well and their part in it. Because if everybody, um, if you don't have all the pieces to the puzzle, you're not gonna see that picture. And we have a lot of missing uh, puzzle pieces with very critical stakeholders, which when I say critical stakeholders, for as a handler, that's gonna be my landlords, my doctors, uh, my restaurant owners, my, you know, those are all stakeholders that really need to have much better tools, much better support. And that begins with educating ourselves and those around us. And to, to just um, stress, you don't have to be a voice because not all of us can be voices, but share, write letters, connect with the people that are putting those tools together to make it really easy to participate because we do need more people to gather around and turn that voice into a shout. And that requires all of us coming together, whether you're DV, whether you're psych, whether you're a guide, we all need to hold hands on this one because it is important. So thank you. And thank you for having us, by the way. Thank you all for coming on. Uh, really quick, um, Scav mentioned this is a network of people and that's what DV Radio is, a network. We wanna bring everybody together and actually do something. Uh, the best way to spread the message is to share. Share this show when it comes out on podcast. Share anything that's out there. Share the, the graphics that uh, PSDP uh, has down in the in the description down below and on their website. Anything you see that pertains to this or anything else, share it, educate. That's That's the best way to help uh, combat, for lack of a better term, any of this, honestly. Um, I don't know what else to say because everybody has covered it. Thank you all for joining us tonight here on Roundtable Discussions. I know it was short notice because I thought of it at the last minute during a show a couple weeks ago because of JJ's ass. Uh, so you can thank him and our two-hour late-night show uh, on Saturday nights. It was his fault. I blame JJ. You did get some of that, too. <laughs> <laughs> right? She encouraged. <laughs> she encouraged. Yes, she did. Uh, but uh, this has been the roundtable discussions here. Really quick, uh, we had Joaquin Watai, Veronica Morris, and Brad, also Scav and Nia here with us this evening. Thank you all for joining us. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please do not hesitate to email us, contact any of us at any given time. If you contact us at the radio, we'll get it to the proper people and they'll answer you back. Uh, for everyone here, I'm Bo. Thank you for joining us again here on dvradio.net, WDVR. And don't forget to leave your thoughts on this roundtable discussions down below in the comments section. If you have any ideas for an upcoming roundtable discussions, let us know. Thank you for joining us for roundtable discussions about the American Kennel Club and ID registration.